All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Arrhythmia Cyber Chats. We do this every Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and today we will be looking at the state of cybersecurity uh, by going through a bunch of cybersecurity reports uh, for 2022 and some 2023. And we will ask also, uh, we will introduce what cybersecurity reports are, uh, industry reports, annual industry reports, and what you can do with those and what kind of information you'll be able to find in those. Uh, I'm Dr. Emmanuel Edu. I'm going to be uh, your instructor slash host for this uh, program. We are transmitting on YouTube uh, as well. And this is also going to be recorded and posted back on YouTube, the replay. Uh, so we will begin here shortly uh, with cyber news. But uh, before then, uh, I would love to open the floor for any questions, comments uh, before we kick it off whilst I'm trying to share. Uh, the slide that we're going to be looking at. And we are going to look at, I think, five or six uh, security reports, annual uh, security uh, reports, right? So there's going to be a lot of insights. Uh, Leonard, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Adu. Um, so I asked a question earlier on about um, the suspect that was recently apprehended. I was asking, um, who do we do tagging as a script key? For, for fun. So what one uh, insight about this? Okay, so uh, if I got you right, I think you are coming in broken. Oh, I don't know if it's on my side, but uh, I think you are asking if uh, the like the news that happened, uh, if we will consider the the airman as a script, uh, script kitty. Uh, technically, no. <laughs> right uh mm -hmm. he he wasn't trying to like he had access to the information and he just uh took it and placed it where he he wasn't supposed to right so he didn't really kind of uh hack or try to break or bridge uh the system right uh so we not necessarily a script kitty but just for fun you, you can target like that but mostly uh when we talk about script kitty uh, it's a form like it's a type of a hacker who really doesn't uh, know much of programming, right? They don't have their own uh, script that they are using. They are using somebody else's script that they find somewhere online and uh, other places, and they are using that for exploits, right? So they don't, and they are not really well vested uh, in what they are doing. So they don't really know what is really going on, whether it's going to work or not, right? So uh, in this case, uh, he had access to. The information already so he didn't try to bridge or you know he's not like your hacker or any type of hacker who try to you know uh, bridge and steal the information so technically not a script kid he's an inside 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 yeah inside trades. so all right thank you thanks so and that is the first uh for cyber news that is what we are going to be discussing before we move on to what we are talking about tonight uh yes tonight so uh we will still have people coming in that is why we are a bit distracted so uh, all right uh welcome everybody once again so today's topic is we are looking at the state of uh cyber security and we will be looking at different reports uh, industry reports and this is also going to be an exposure to most of you uh when we talk about cyber security reports and i'm also going to show you how you'll be able to use these reports to really get ahead of the game and you know gain some uh, insights, right? So uh, things that will probably get you, or things that will take you years to uh, learn, or like some experiences that you take you years to uh, have, you'll be able to get all those from different reports, right? And see exactly what is going on in the industry without even necessarily working in the industry. So that is what we'll be looking at. So uh, I'm Dr. Emmanuel Edu. For anybody who is new to our family, uh, welcome. This is Arrhythmia Cyber Chat. Uh, we do this every Friday. I'm Dr. Emmanuel Ledu, a former United States Army captain. I'm a uh, the founder of Arrhythmia uh, Inc. and Arrhythmia Academy. Uh, I'm a cyber security professional. Uh, I'm a trainer, instructor. I love to teach. Uh, I'm a QSA. Uh, my the our uh, PC our uh, cyber security. Uh, uh, stronghold within Arrhythmus Inc. is PCI DSS, right? We do PCI DSS uh, audits and assessments. Uh, we are based in New York and our academy 
uh, obviously is online. We are also based in New York, but uh, you can take uh, any of our courses or our training anywhere uh, in the world. So we are starting off today. We will first be looking at cyber news, right? Uh, today we're just going to be discussing what happened uh, to the airman, and you know uh, what are some of the things they could have done well, and some of the things uh, that you know maybe probably he didn't know or like what he he should have or shouldn't have done. Right. And then we will jump into our main topic for tonight. That is uh, our cybersecurity annual report and the types of reports. Uh, and we will look at some examples of the reports and really gain some insights into these reports. Okay. So cyber news, we are starting with uh, yours truly. So uh, this airman, uh, he got arrested on Thursday, a 21 year old, you know, uh, a pretty young man works uh, as National Guard. So for anybody who is not, uh, maybe if you don't know the difference between, you know, how like the military is set up. So they have the active duty who are, you know, active soldiers or airmen or seamen, right? So they do that, uh, like that is their full-time job, right? And then they have uh, other soldiers or airmen who are doing it part-time. So if you are doing it for the States, you have that tag for the Army is National Guard, for uh, the Air Force is National uh, Guardsman, right? And then that, so if you hear anything national, uh, that is more towards uh, for the states and reserve is for federal, right? So all part-time soldiers or part-time airmen, uh, if you are reserved, you are for the federal government. Uh, if you are national, you are for the states, right? So for either reserve or national, you are doing it part-time. So I think they do drills twice or once a month or twice a month. Uh, maybe I stand to be corrected by Michael and the rest on here. Uh, so uh, this guy, I don't really know which, uh, maybe some people who have read more about this will give me some insights. I don't know his MOS or his military uh, occupation, but I believe he's probably working in intelligence, right? Something on those lines. And he was preview to some high level information. Uh, I don't know if it's top secret or secret, but that shows that he has either security clearance, uh, he has secret or top secret clearance, right? So he is previewed to this information and I don't know for what, why he will uh, download this information and uh, you know just put it in the public space. So uh, he got himself in trouble, uh, long story short, and this can, you know, uh, uh, put him, you know, off to jail for a while, right? Uh, I don't really think he had any malicious intent. He's just being uh, dumb, right? But uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse. So uh, we just have to be careful. Now, if anybody has any insights or some people, okay, he was, yes, intelligence or IT security, uh, I assume, because for you to have that information, you have to be working or come close to that information. You have to be working in uh, intelligence. I mean, the fact that you have security, I had security clearance. I was a captain, but I wasn't uh, preview to any of this information. So it's need to know, right? If your job doesn't require you to come in contact with that information, you wouldn't come in contact with that information. So for him to have access to that, then that means he was working uh, on those lines, right? Uh, so, and I think, Maybe probably uh, the, the Air Force could have also, uh, maybe, I'm not really sure how he was able to get the data, you know, off work computer uh, and use it, uh, like post it elsewhere. So did he use pen drive or like some thumb drive or did he just email it to he, himself? He took hard copies. He took hard, hard copies. copies. Yes. Oh, and then he took pictures of it and then put it on there. Oh, okay. Wow, I mean, uh, he went through all that trouble to get himself in trouble. I mean, so uh, what could have, so, I mean, you, I just want like five people. Uh, what do you think are some of the measures or controls they could have put in place to prevent this from happening? Uh, if you raise your virtual hand, I'll let you go. Uh, Leonard, go ahead. No, no, oh, that was an error. I, I didn't bring it down. Okay. Let me get it down. <laughs> okay, uh, Vincent. Okay, can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you. 
Well, two things that are key for me in all in this issue. I think the first thing is to first um, establish the fact that it was not a script uh, kitty, as someone had said earlier. It was just an inside out thread. But to answer your question, I think least um, the rule of least privilege would have solved a lot of problems because one is 21. So I don't know when he joined and all that, but it seems to me like he had a lot of access. But if we're going by the rules of um, cybersecurity, the, the rule of uh, least privilege would have solved a lot of that problem. Meaning even if he was involved in all that, he wouldn't have had access to it because he had no need to know, you know? So I think that was a, that would have helped. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Aliku. Yeah, I, uh, I think uh, I agree with uh, Pastor Lydia Spock. And one of the other things I'd like to say is uh, usually when um, a person is requests like information in a folder, I think have, just making sure that whatever was returned is what was given would help stop, you know, because apparently he, he, he took the papers from like hard copies and maybe shoved them in his pocket and left with them. Uh, so that's one theory because, you know, the paper was like folded in a hurry a, a, according to what was posted out there. So I believe uh, if just like when you give a, a file and you expect when it comes back, it's, it's not um, less than <laughs> what someone took, you know, to view. Uh, I'm not sure what can be put in place when it's a uh, hard copy information. Uh, to ensure that what's left or what somebody signed out is the exact same that is being signed in. And I believe some of these things you read in, a, uh, you have to like go into a place where they are stored and you read them there and leave them there and come out. So maybe making sure that not just one person is in there could also help having security cameras in the place could also help. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks for the, uh, your input, Aleku. Uh, Randall, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I was gonna say similar to what Alekum said, but you know, one thing is what are they willing to do now that this has happened versus what they should have done. They should have done it anyway in the beginning. Right. You know, sometimes we we do stuff that we should do after we get burnt. I mean, it's like it's like a kid's getting a spanking. You know, you won't do it again after you get a spanking, so to speak. But um, but beyond that point, obviously, you know, no, no camera, no phones allowed, uh, especially if it's not a government issued phone uh, and things of this nature. Oh, OK. Uh, thank you, Randall. Uh, Really great insights. Uh, I think Marcel, go ahead, Marcel. Yes, I'm gonna make a big assumption that maybe he may have been printing this thing remotely. So, so that I could feel free because printing something like this probably may be, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna assume that then I'll say, maybe you could limit the access hours, the access hours, maybe you could limit remote access. That's another thing to think about. And then also certain documents could be, uh, you, could, you could prevent people from printing them. You, you can't just print it. Maybe that's, those are some of the things I can think about, given the situation. Okay, uh, thank you, Marcel. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot, uh, if I got your name right. Uh, if I didn't, please let me know how to pronounce it well. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Ike. Yeah, this is uh, Ike. Go ahead, Ike. Good evening, everyone. Okay, I, I think um, I I support uh, one or two things. Um, um, my other uh, uh, co-student said they were supposed to be like um, uh, when it comes to access control, privilege uh, users access 
But then I was confused. Why, why would he have such access without something go, going through, like the last speaker said, why, why can't he go through other, like someone to verify and cross check, like an access control before you approve something, it has to pass through the right person to make sure that anything you are approving is you're authorized, you have that access. Then the, you, you cannot be the only one to print it, uh, look at it, and there's a kind of monitoring. There was there was nobody monitoring the system, what he's doing. He just he just have that access. Is he really I, I don't know because I, I'm thinking. Does it mean he have that that uh, uh, privilege access? Maybe that's why. But for me, I think they should have done better to put some some access controls where when you, when you want to log in, it will send notification to like the the uh, the higher uh, uh, manager or security authority to say, okay, do this person have this access and they will grant the access. Like he, he he's not supposed to have the access directly by himself like that. That's my contribution. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ike. Uh, I think next in line is uh, Pabe. Phoebe. Phoebe. Uh, when I, okay, so I either say Phoebe or, okay, Phoebe. Yeah. I'm going to get it right. Phoebe, please go ahead. Yes. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, this afternoon, I was listening to the news and uh, what I realized that uh, the guy was a team member that they do a research on certain things. So uh, it was believed that he was trusted so much. So they didn't even think that he would be doing certain things like that. So he has a privilege, but he just uh, uh, abused it abuse the uh, privilege and and what i realized also is that there was not proper monitoring there was no proper monitoring so what that is what i can say okay uh thank you phoebe so uh i'm not gonna get it wrong now so i have uh is michael on here i, I just wanted to pick his brain on something real quick uh i've not been in national guard or reserve right i've always been in active yeah, duty michael is here but michael. yeah from from what i've seen when we used to work with national guard and reserve folks right they were more laxed you know they were not sometimes not really on top of their game and this is not to take anything away from national guard or reserve you know folks but uh michael has been michael you know is uh a captain in the air force uh, he used to be on active duty. Now he's in reserve or national. I, I don't know if Michael is doing like the national gas man or reserve. But uh, Michael, like, what is your take when it, when you were on active duty, and then now that you are in the reserve, like in terms of security, in terms of uh, really keeping up to speed as to what is going on, and you know how serious people take their job. Like, what is your take on it? Because you've been on both sides. Uh, I cannot speak to it because I can only assume you know, for those in the reserve, not, I mean, because I've only been on active duty. Uh, what is your take on this since you've been on both sides? Um, yeah, Dr. Du, thank you for giving me the platform, but yeah, this is a very, very strange uh, situation to be all, um, to be honest with you, because the way the thing happened, so everybody who is allowed to work in that, that environment needs to have a top security clearance. So I know that he 100% has a top security clearance already, uh, because because you cannot have that before you can access, before going to that uh, environment. That's number one. And number two, his rule, he's just an IT guy, right? We call it uh, his AFSC or his MOS is the uh, cyber transportation specialist. So they work on the IT and everything in the Pentagon. So what he did was he had access to a lot of data, right? So I'm here thinking from a security standpoint, I'm thinking about how did he, um, was he able to exfiltrate all that information? And mind you, um, I'm not here to insinuate anything, but this is something that we just got to know about it. Who knows? There might be someone who's also is doing the same thing, but we just don't know about it. This guy, what he did was um, he went online. He has a gaming platform that has people across 
across uh, the US, Russia, and Ukraine. So this is a very, very big deal. FBI did an investigation. He's been posting stuff online with regards to, I don't want to go into all that details, but um, he has a platform that he works with people in Russia, in Ukraine. And what he was doing was uh, posting all that information on the platform just to um, let them know that, hey, I'm the guy, I have access to all this information. But I'm actually surprised um, that there wasn't any form of um, checks because I know they are always very tight. Um, before you log in into anything, um, there has to be um, someone accessing. Um, there has to be some form of control as to um, which um, side of the network you can access and stuff like that. But since he had a top secret clearance and also since he's an IT guy, I'm thinking he has access to pretty much everything because he has to work on them. But my, my surprise was the way he was able to um, leak that information and even just coming out of that room, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just surprised. So from a security standpoint, of course, um, there's some loopholes. Uh, they have to probably Im implement more security controls, uh, both physical, technical, and also admin as well to ensure that this doesn't happen uh, again. But with your question with the National Guard and also with the active duty, it's pretty much the same thing. The only difference is active duty, that is your full-time job 24-7. With the National Guard, you only do it twice a month. Um, typically, it's the first Saturday and Sunday of every month. And um, depending on his role, he might probably be on um, some active duty orders that he's doing maybe a 30-day order down there uh, working for 30 days, 60 days, whatever the case may be. But with the difference, um, it's they all go through the same school. They go through the same training. The only difference is active duty. You do it all the time, 24, 7, 365. But with the guard, you only do your normal job on the civilian side. Okay. But you do um, um, your Air Force drill or the Air National Guard just two days in a month, which is typically the first Saturday and Sunday of every month. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michael. So great insight. I think uh, Ike and Alfred uh, still has their virtual hands up. So I'm going to let Ike go. Or uh, I don't know if Ike is from the last time. Uh, but OK, let uh, Alfred go first, and then Ike, and then we'll move on. Sorry, it's from the last time. OK, then go ahead, Alfred. Hi, Dr. Um, Idu. Yeah, how are you doing, Alfred? Good, good. Uh, with my experience with the uh, federal system or the federal government, um, most of these IT guys, they occasionally have uh, access to, to, to top management uh, systems, especially when they run into any problems or they want to troubleshoot anything. So they always grant them access to get into their systems and they go through a lot of stuff. I don't know if this was one of those occasions where this guy fumbled into some of these materials through that means. and. Uh, got access to all of that material. So it occasionally happens. And sometimes, um, considering that he was 21, he might have joined the, 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 the system earlier on and had been bumped up to a certain level where he was one of those guys that probably they upgraded a case to him or they mostly upgrade cases to him and he has access to some of the bigger stuff. That may be one of the reasons. Then second, uh, considering that these materials have been online for or in order in a forum for almost uh, for months, um, it may be uh, the race of this guy. That is a possibility because uh, people who doesn't uh, have certain privileges in certain races may not or may be monitored more closely than certain races. So that may be a possibility as well that he wasn't monitored because of who he was. And a lot of times they have more confidence in such people than the others. So that is what I am thinking happened here. That is why this material went for so long without being caught. Uh, that was just a contribution okay. I wanted to keep in. Okay, Alfred, uh, uh, thanks for your, uh, for your insight. So now there is a lot of uh, speculation. I mean, everything we're talking about is what ifs. Uh, we don't exactly know, you know, what happened. We are here to get more information. So that is uh, good insights. I mean, if you are able to, you know, uh, come up with solutions, possible solutions to this, uh, you're on the right path. Uh, so, but overall, I think access control, uh, they should have monitored it well, right? Uh, and trust, right? They shouldn't just be giving people uh, blank checks when it comes to trust. I know, you know, we get complacent when you work with, you know, certain people for a long time, 
uh, you expect them to do certain things, right? And especially like in the uh, in the Air Force setting or in the Army setting, uh, if somebody is at a certain rank, you expect you know a certain level of discipline and uh, integrity from them, right? So uh, not you know everybody is going to play by those rules, or you know people have their own uh, ideologies and uh, things. So uh, I remember there was a case whereby I think one private in the army, uh, he's probably still in jail, right? He tried to review supposedly uh, classified information uh, to some, uh, I think like some uh, folks in Afghanistan or somewhere. They didn't know it was FBI folks that he was dealing with. And guess what he was trying to review? It was simply uh, manuals for like Humvees and vehicles that we use. You can find these online anyways, right? So, and he was trying to give it to them for free because he hated the United States. And like, this was, you know, like a guy who's been in, I think he was in the army for like two or three years, right? So uh, I don't really, so, and that got him in trouble. So, but this guy really had some, you know, good info, right? Uh, that, that this is also gonna land him in trouble. So it depends, maybe they might be doing everything right with their head screwed on, right? And then they might just be out of, or just to show off or because of some ideology or something that they've really started uh, indulging themselves in might influence all this. So that is why uh, insider threats, sometimes you don't really see it coming. It is gonna hit you on the blind side. So uh, we just have to make sure we are putting layers of layers uh, in place. Uh, that way we are doing our defense in depth, uh, well hardened defense in depth. That way things like this, we are able to minimize it. I mean, you cannot, totally stop things like this from happening uh but you know we can minimize it so uh, it can also be i'm not sure that this was by accident that it just you know probably uploading something else and he uploaded this onto some game sites uh that might be far from the truth but i mean who knows he might come up with some funny defense right so let's jump in uh we are going to look at the state of cyber security and we are going to do that through looking at uh, annual cybersecurity reports, right? So what are annual cybersecurity reports? So for before we even jump into that, for uh, everyone on here, whether you are already working in the security space or you are trying to get into the security space, like I always say, uh, you have to be a long, long, long-term learner or how do they call it? Lifelong. I remember when I was doing my PhD, they used to, they have some term, like lifelong learner right? Lifelong learner of the industry. So uh, as part of being a lifelong learner of the industry, you have to uh, be aware of almost all the top industry reports that comes out annually, because these industry reports are based on research. Uh, they are based on industry insights, right? So uh, by sitting at your desk, uh, being a cybersecurity analyst, a cybersecurity manager, uh, information security assurance specialist, uh, you are doing your job all right, but you have to know what is going on in other areas and other sectors and other industries when it comes to security, right? That is how you'll be able to stay abreast with what is going on. And then when you have to switch jobs and go elsewhere, uh, it's not gonna, there's not going to be a big shock, right? Because now you've just been doing just this one thing and a lot of things are going on and you don't even know what is going on. And then also you see industry trends, right? So, uh, Cyber security uh, annual reports, just like other annual reports in other industries, uh, within the cyber security space or information security space, uh, reports, annual reports are made by different organizations, right, different companies, and there is really no limit to who can make annual reports, right? Uh, these are not necessarily academic papers, but they kind of mimic academic research uh, by interviewing industry players and seeing what is going on. So they are reports, uh, that are published by different industry players. Uh, and the main goal of these reports, uh, we will look at the goals, right? Uh, but just a gist of that, like the main goals are just to give insights, uh, do some analysis of things that are going on, uh, latest trends, threats, uh, most important threats and vulnerabilities and type of risks, you know, uh, like the different types of risks that are going on, right? And how attackers are attacking incidents, different types of incidents, what attackers are using, uh, there was a report, I think I still uh, couldn't remember to add that, uh, but there was uh, a study on ransomware, right? 
think that was in 2021, 2019, there about where like after the research, they find like they found that most companies, if you get hit with a ransomware and you pay the ransom, the hackers wouldn't still release your data. Right. If it wasn't from that report, everybody in the industry doesn't know what Randall is doing or what uh, Eliku LLC is doing. Right. So they get breached. They get hit with a ransomware. They pay the money. They don't get their data back. But then nobody else knows about it, that they didn't get their data back. Right. So when this report came out and everybody in the industry realized, oh, then what is the need of paying these uh, attackers the ransom? Right. So they start like they stop paying the ransom. OK, you can take our data. It's going to affect our business. But we're going to move on with our lives because when we pay the millions you are not still going to give us our data so now everybody who was getting breached or who became a victim were also protesting that they were not going to pay they were going to take their losses right now attackers saw that that was bad for business so they started releasing some of the data and then you know uh, victims also started paying some of the money so it's kind of funny how just that one report was able to turn that whole thing around either than that up to now you still pay the ransom and still not get your data, right? Hoping you are going to get the data, you're going to pay millions and still not get your data, right? But uh, that exposure really, you know, uh, exposed these uh, malicious actors. And now they had to change their tactics by releasing some of the data or even all of it. Uh, and then victims, when they saw that, okay, these, they are releasing some of it, then when you get breached, you pay in the hope that you might be one of the lucky ones that you are going to get your data back, right? So, uh, annual cyber security reports or information security reports, uh, they are really predominantly to give insights uh, into the industry. And then we also have, uh, so these reports, they have different focus or like different focuses for uh, like whatever that company wants to, you know, uh, whatever tr uh, trend or route that they want to take, right? There are some that focus on uh, the, uh, like the workforce within cybersecurity space. There are some that will focus on incident response. There are some that will focus on data breaches, right? So we will look at all some of like the popular ones that are out there, right? So now let's look at the goals. I think we kind of uh, briefly touched on some of the goals why uh, these reports are made annually, right? So aside the companies who are making these reports, uh, trying to uh, exhibit their, uh, to like trying to show that they are, uh, they are uh, real players within the industry or like they matter when it comes to the industry, you know, trying to sell themselves. And they're also doing a good service, right? By taking the time, paying researchers to really go through the whole entire year and do this research and give us the results uh, for us to get some insight. So the first goal, or not in any special order, but uh, one of the goals, right, is to analyze the latest threats and vulnerabilities, which is key. Right, uh, we wouldn't be able to know what is going on in terms of threats and vulnerabilities uh, if it wasn't for most of these uh, research and these reports that we are able to uh, get our hands on. Right, so uh, this will really inform uh, you if you work in any organization or even as an individual. Uh, if you go through some of these reports, you will, you'll be able to pick up on some of the uh, trending threats. Right, so you plan accordingly to prevent yourself uh, from falling victim to this. And if you're an organization, uh, it behooves you and your security team to take these reports seriously, right? And we are going to look at some of these reports. Now, the second thing is uh, they present trends and statistics uh, within the industry, right? So we will look at some of the trends and statistics when you look at the different types of reports. Now, also best practices. So after going through uh, some of the threats uh, and trends and stuff, uh, they also do some, they give some recommendations uh, as to some of the best practices that we can indulge in to help uh, stay on the right side of security, right? And then also to raise awareness, very big, right? To raise awareness uh, of things that are going on within the industry. So it can be threats, it can be vulnerabilities, it can be, you know, uh, maybe some uh, easy ways of doing things, right? Or uh, just some good info that is going to help the organization uh, in in general, right? And if you are somebody who wants to get into the industry, it is good for you to know some of the statistics within the industry in terms of employment, uh, which areas are employing more, what skills are more needed than others, right? To have all those uh, at your fingertips, right? So that way it will inform how you apply for jobs and which jobs you apply for, right? And then also uh, 
tracking the progress of cyber of the whole entire cybersecurity uh, industry. The, these reports also helps us to do that, right? And then industry specific or regional uh, analysis, we are able to get that as well. Incidents, that is big. There are a lot of uh, incident response. Uh, there are a lot of incidents uh, uh, reports out there as well. We'll look at, I think we'll look at one. Uh, and so now let's look at some of the popular cybersecurity annual reports that are out there. One of the bigger, like the big names when it comes to these reports, uh, Verizon. Right, so Verizon, they are not just into uh, cellular, cell phone stuff, uh, but they are also a, they are also a big player when it comes to cybersecurity or information security. So Verizon, they have the data breach investigations report, right? That gives a lot of good insight into data breaches throughout the whole entire year, right? Which industries, you know, were more vulnerable, which ones suffered more data breaches than others. And then they also have for PCI, anybody who is, you know, really uh, who wants to dive head deep into PCI uh, to be, an, to be uh, a learner of the industry. Uh, even PCI doesn't, they don't have, uh, PCI don't have uh, any annual reports, right? Uh, but Verizon do. So Verizon has the payment security report uh, and they've been doing it for the past, I think like 12 years. So every year they come up with a report. They will show you which requirements organizations are struggling with, which ones are, you know, they are passing easily. So if you want to, you know, be successful in PCI, that is a place that you can also uh, start from and learn more about the industry, right? But for uh, today, we were just going to be looking at the data breach investigations report. And I think for our PCI uh, uh, classes, uh, some of them, we have them do uh, a presentation on the uh, payment security reports. I think they did one for 2022, right? Uh, the 2023, obviously, we are in 2023. The 2022 is out. 2021, going back, you can go as back, as far back as I think 2010, right? Now, Cisco also a big player uh, within the space. Uh, so Cisco has the Cisco annual uh, cybersecurity reports, right? That also highlights some trends and uh, some of the threat vectors, uh, cyber crime tactics that attackers are using uh, out there, right? Now, we uh Semantic, a big player. They have the Internet Security Threat Report. And this report also uh, kind of uh, focuses more on uh, phishing and malware and uh, most of the common attacks that uh, we know. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, like the McFay uh, lab reports, uh, labs uh, threat report. Uh, this also gives more insight into uh, kind of similar to uh, like the semantic uh, report, right? It, it focuses more on uh, threats and uh, patterns of attack that attackers are using throughout the whole entire year, right? Uh, Crowd Strike is also one of the big players uh, within the cyberspace. They have their global threats reports. And the name speaks for it. It focuses on threats most uh, often uh, attackers kind of uh, like hackers, uh, uh, APTs, and techniques and tactics that they are using, uh, kind of uh, throwing more like similar to what we have in MIDA and ATT&CK, right? But this is annually, so uh, they are up to date uh, more than, you know, MIDA and ATT&CK, but MIDA and ATT&CK has their own thing also going on. And then we have the uh, Hunom uh, Institute Cost of uh, Data Breach Report, uh, also focusing on the financial side when it comes to data breaches, right? Uh, how much it costs organizations when they get breached. And they also give you some uh, case studies of organizations that got breached and how much uh, they have to cover, right? So uh, all these will give you some insight. So let's say uh, if your organization, you have to do a presentation uh, to your C-suite on why you need certain solutions within your organization and why it is costing that much, uh, you might want to use this report to show them the figures and the numbers for companies who didn't take security seriously or who did maybe something wrong or fell victim to these breaches and how much they have to pay. Right? And I think that will uh, that comparison will let them know that whatever they are spending is really nothing compared to what they can lose when they get breached. Right now, uh, NIST obviously we cannot talk about reports without you know talking about. So NIST, if you didn't know, NIST has they are annual cybersecurity uh, and privacy reports, right? And for they have it for every physical year. 
right? So uh, I think the latest one that uh, I came across with was, I think 2022 is there, I'm not sure, but 2021, right? And they list this uh, together with the frameworks. So uh, it is not a framework, it's a report for that year, but they list it together with all their publications, right? So if you go to this uh, website, you'll be able to see their cybersecurity and privacy annual report, right? It also has some good insights uh, really into what, you know, went on within the year. Now Splunk, everybody knows Splunk, uh, a big player within the cyberspace and the financial space uh, and managerial and all other spaces because you can use Splunk for so many things. Uh, the app or the application Splunk is what I'm referring to. And the company's name is Splunk also. So Splunk, they also have state of security uh, reports that they come up with. I think they have one for 2023. We will look at that. I think we have that, yes. And then Isaka, uh, everybody who, you know, has been uh, chasing certifications, you should be familiar with Isaka, right? If you want to write CISA, SIM, uh, what is the other one? Like the RICS, uh, the GRC, whatever, they have like a whole list of them, right? Uh, but they are most popular ones, CISA and SIM. So ISACA, they also have their state of cybersecurity reports annually that they come up with, right? So all these are places that you can go to and you don't have to just take one report. So look at it from different perspectives and you'll be able to gain a lot of good insights. And we are going to do some of that tonight, right? So, uh, and then we come to uh, ISE Square. So ISE Square for them, their report focuses on the workforce, the cyber workforce. Right. I think that is one that everybody on here will be uh, delighted to take a look at. So we will look at that maybe probably first and then we will jump into uh, cybersecurity, uh, the actual cybersecurity areas with threats and stuff like that. Right. And then Comtia, uh, which is also one of the certification bodies. Uh, Comtia also has a state of cybersecurity uh, report that they also come up with. I think their most current is 2022. Right. So uh, with this, I think we are going to move into uh, look at the actual reports, but before we do, uh, our Easter promotion that we were doing, the 30%, it ends tomorrow. And our PCI DSS class, new class starts on 18th April. So for anybody who wants to get into that, uh, the links will be posted. Or if you reach out, uh, we will uh, give you the link for you to be able to register and you can take advantage of the 30% also as well. And for the PCI DSS, uh, if you are new to PCI DSS, uh, you can go to our website, arithmisacademy.com. Uh, you should take our free PCI DSS course, the PCI DSS for beginners. And then from there, your career path, uh, you can start with the PCI DSS specialist and then uh, move upgrade into PCI DSS, uh, PCI DSS expert, or you can start straight with expert because expert covers everything within the specialist and then some, right? Uh, so. These are the prices for it, but with the promotion going on, I think the 7,500 comes down to uh, 51, 5,000, uh, I think 5,125 or something. And then the 5,500 comes down to 3,850. So uh, now for anybody else without just the PCI, uh, if you want to get into cybersecurity, uh, you have no IT background, our advice is for you to start with our cybersecurity entry level course, which will move you from where you are now to where you can start working as a full blown cybersecurity professional, right? Uh, most people will, you know, reach out and they want to jump straight from no background, no uh, IT or cybersecurity background, straight into PCI. We do not really advise that, right? Uh, we do not advise that because you need some background to be able to understand what is going on in PCI. PCI is a specialty area within cybersecurity. Right. So with no cybersecurity or IT background, if you have an IT background, yes, we can work with you because for the PCI, we go through a, P a cybersecurity crash course. So at least you'll be able to pick up on some of the, uh, you know, uh, P uh, some of the cybersecurity concepts uh, as we move along. But because you have an IT background, it's a bit easier for you to catch up than with zero. Right. With zero, our cybersecurity entry level course is going to be your best bet uh, because that covers everything in terms of knowledge, scale. Uh, working with some of the hands-on uh, tools, like some of the popular tools that you encounter on the job, like Splunk, Nexus, and the rest. And then you have internship and then job placement assistance. And then you will, you know, be on the job market, uh, land a job, work as a security professional, and then you can maybe come back around uh, to do PCI, right? So jumping straight into PCI with no background, not really advisable. 
uh, you can go through the course, but the course is not going to go through you. Because once you're done, when you start applying for jobs, is when you realize that you have a lot of gaps within your knowledge base, right? And we don't want to turn around and say, oh, Dr. Edu lied to me, right? We will tell you as it is. If you still insist, I mean, you have some background, you can do it. All right. But don't say we didn't tell you, right? But for if you want to break into the industry uh, without necessarily going the PCI route, because you do not have to, if you just want to work in cybersecurity, uh, you can work in different uh, job roles with just our cybersecurity entry level course, right? So now let's uh, move on. If there are no questions, we are going to start looking at some of these reports. All right, so with the reports, we are first, firstly, uh, we are going to look at, I think Alex, uh, Alexander, go ahead. Alexander has his hand up. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't able to take advantage of this 30% off. I was wondering, um, sometime in like, um, let's say 4th of July, would you have another special, do you know? Yes, so mostly with occasions like that, we have some uh, promotions. So 4th of July, yes, most definitely, we're gonna have something going on. I appreciate it, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, and uh, okay, uh, anybody have any issues with the audio? I think uh, Jerry was having an issue with it. I just saw that. Okay, so we are going to move on. So we are going to look at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven reports, right? And the rest, uh, there is a whole list of them. So uh, after this presentation, you can just go to Google and search cybersecurity annual reports. There's always, like there's gonna be a whole uh, list of it that is gonna come out. Download these reports, uh, do a quick review, go through them, and uh, you can you know spread it over weeks. So every week you're gonna look at one. That is how you get ahead in the industry, frankly. Uh, most people, they are in the industry, but most of them don't even know about these reports or they don't know what to use them for. And also, if you work in uh, any capacity that you have to be doing presentations or you have to be doing uh, security awareness training, these are your go-to resource, right? So if they want to do something on uh, malware attacks, now you have a report that really is outlining uh, everything in terms of malware attacks, the tactics they are using, uh, ransom that people are paying, do they release data, they, do, do they not release data, right? All that, uh, you don't have to look any further. Somebody has done the legwork for you. You just have to take it and, you know, make it your own, right? So uh, we are going to look at uh, this report. So uh, we'll come to all the questions in the chat. Uh, Michael, if you can keep an eye on all those questions in the chat for me. Uh, so we will look at Splunk's uh, state of security. Okay, so I think I promise we're going to look at the workforce one from ISC Square first. For uh, our folks on here who want to get some insight into what is going on in the cybersecurity workforce, this is your go-to, right? And this is by ISC Square. When you go to their website, you'll be able to download this. So let's do a quick run through. Now, this is for uh, it says a critical need for cybersecurity professionals persist amidst, uh, ad, amidst a year of cultural and workplace uh, evolution. Okay, so uh, let's move on. Mostly it will follow the normal path for a report, right? I guess uh, executive summary and then everything else will follow. So uh, we're not going to, you can read executive summary and all that. We're just going to look at some numbers and figures, right? So they, Estimates based on their research that they did uh, estimate that the global cybersecurity workforce estimates uh, for 2020 is going to be 4.6. Uh, I think that is 4.6 million, right? Okay, yes, 4.6 million, and they looked at it from North America, uh, Latin America, and I don't know which this continent is, and I think this is Asia. Mm, I stand to be corrected, right? And so this is their estimates from and like the breakdown by by country, uh, yes, so breakdown by uh, continent, sort of, or by country, so UK, France, and all these people. So you can look at that. Now let's move on. Now this is the gap, right? Uh, kind of the shortage of cybersecurity professionals globally is 3.4 million, right? And this is not Dr. Edu saying, this is from a research that ISC Square did, right? So, and they, are, they, they also break it down. For the United States, 
uh, is 360. I think now it is, if somebody can check on CyberSeek, I think most people on here knows about CyberSeek. I think now it's around 700 and something, uh, not 400 anymore, right? And then for the different areas, this is the numbers right there, right? So uh, this is the global gap for security professionals and they have it broken down here. Now, this is where you get some really good insights. Uh, I think this these were like questionnaires that they pushed out to uh, folks. So we will skip that one. We will skip this one. Uh, we will skip this one too as well. Okay, so we will skip this as well. Now, uh, which of the following is your organization doing planning? Okay, so uh, we are still on the questionnaire that they they use. Okay. Now, what it means for organization, the gap, understanding. Okay. So there are some key areas that I want us to look at. That is why I'm skipping. Uh, and that is also to kind of whet your appetite for you to, you know, take time, download this and go through uh, yourself. Now they even have uh, like statistics on how long it takes to fill a cyber security position and all that, right? And they have like age statistics uh, in terms of age and gender, how many people are working in security, how many people are, you know, like what category of folks are working in security and what category of folks are not and all that. Uh, keep going down. Uh, sorry, there's like a lot of pages, so keep going. Uh, when we get to where I want us to talk about, uh, I will, okay, every person in line to have one banner, okay. So all those are uh, statistics from people who are working in the industry, uh, okay. Uh, okay, I think we are coming to where I wanted. Okay, so diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. So by age, uh, age by race. So 60 and older, non-white. I mean, all these are statistics for folks working within the security industry, age by gender. Okay, so, so all these are really good insights, right? Uh, age by gender and then uh, age group by race, by gender. So now most, uh, almost every company today is, uh, how do they call it, equal opportunity company, right? So uh, if you see your uh, ethnicity is really underrepresented here, uh, that means that you have a better chance of getting picked, right? If you come head to head with somebody whose ethnicity has more people within that space. So uh, it is good to really school yourself on this as well. So. And you are not going to get this information anywhere if you don't find it in a report, right? And then also they have by country, men and women. Uh, so all these really good insights. Okay, white, non-white, uh, women, men, all those by gender. So what I wanted us to look at, okay, what type of... So sorry, we, just, we are just like running through it. Uh, because we have to, we have other ones that we have to look at. Which of the following best describes the path you took to cybersecurity? Okay, so uh, you look at all that and for degree, high school, uh, the, okay. So all that, what is the highest level of education you have completed? So this was a survey that they contacted with people who are working in the industry, right? So for people who get hanged up on, oh, I don't have a degree, I can't work in the industry. This is going to answer your question because this is not from Dr. Edu saying, but it's from uh, statistics or from like a research that they've done talking to people who work in the industry. So if you see people with just high school who are in there, even if you see three percent, it means without if you have high school, you can work in the industry. Uh, which best describe? Okay, so all these uh, insights that you're gonna gain uh, from so mostly from like if you ask me a question, right? My answers are from what I see in the industry, and then also uh, what I know from reports, right? So what I see and what I think I know, if I see it in a report, that confirms it like, okay, that is going on everywhere else. It's not just what I know within my you know, uh, small 
area or what I see from other sister companies that is, you know, industry wide. Uh, so they like these reports kind of also validates what you think you know, right? And also might not validate what you think you know. Uh, there was one last thing that I wanted us to look at: how long it takes to fill cybersecurity uh, positions within the industry. Okay, the impact of okay, they even talked about impact of Ukraine war on security, and they have a list on here as well. Okay. Good stuff. Now that's why the challenges. Uh, that's why the challenging landscape, uh, we are able to adequately mitigate risks, percentages by industry, right? Uh, that is also here. Good. Future of cybersecurity work. I think what I was looking for is probably coming up here. Uh, organizations, tools, and uh, okay. In conclusion, so oh, I saw that in, in the other report. Okay, any which ways, uh, that is still so. If you maybe probably because I was rushing, if you take your time and you go through, uh, okay, steady participants. So, this is the number of people they got from different industries that they interviewed for this research, right? So, at least you have some good insight into how they came up with their numbers and their figures. Uh, as well, right? So this is the end of that report. That is for the cybersecurity workforce. Okay, so now let's look at uh, not incidents. Let's look at NIST. So we will look at NIST cybersecurity uh, privacy annual report. This is for fiscal year 2021, right? And this is, I downloaded this from NIST. Right, so this is everybody can go on this website and download it. Uh, they made this in September 2022. I think they have the 2022 version uh, there. I'm not sure. Uh, so next, uh, mostly for them, they focus mostly on what is going to help the government, right? Because they are more inclined to that side, but still they have a lot of uh, good practices, right? So cryptographic standards and validation. Uh, it talks give you some good insight. Uh, into some of the best practices. So mostly when we, we talk about best practices in these reports, NIST is one of the go-to places, right? And sometimes they get crazy, they get uh, super, super technical, but I mean, uh, you you also have to get technical, all right? So uh, things that you don't really, are not familiar with, you can always look up. So cybersecurity measures, uh, this is kind of plain. You can read this and understand more than the cryptographic stuff that they had on there. Uh, so that also you go through education and workforce, very critical uh, education and workforce. So I think we will have a cyber chat on uh, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, NICE. So NICE has a framework that maybe most people are not familiar with. But if you've gone through our entry-level course or even our free course, you would have encountered NICE, uh, their framework, right? Uh, so, but we will do a full-blown cybersecurity workforce uh, security uh, cyber charts here one of these days. Uh, so they are also touching on what is going on in terms of the cybersecurity education, identity and access management. They also touch on identity and access management. So like I was saying, right, they look more on the government side. Uh, PIV is smart cars that are used in the government space. Uh, privacy engineering. So there is a lot of good insights right from here uh i think there is risk management so you can go through read and get some more insight into this uh, goal of this is to expose you to this now uh moving forward i think we will pick we can pick one uh report right one we will uh kind of do a right uh, like we'll kind of do uh like a lottery and just pick uh three reports and do a quick a, a really broad overview of those uh on cyber charts one of these days Right. And uh, okay. So with the NIST, we are just going to jump on uh, trust, trustworthy networks. Uh, I don't know what they have for the other list, but they have some good, you know, stuff in there. I think the last report that I read from them wasn't this one. It was for a year before this one. Right. So, yes, everybody has seen this. 
uh, please do well and take a look at it. Now let's go to uh, State of the Nation from Splunk. Uh, st not State of the Nation, State of Security from Splunk. Right now, Splunk also a big player within the industry. Uh, let's look at what they have. So they even talk about the methodology that they use for the research. Uh, industries that they looked at, 15 industries, 10 uh, countries, uh, top security. So yes, you know, like I was saying, you are going to gain a lot of good insights here. Uh, top cybersecurity challenges. Respondents chose their top three internal challenges. So they have a list here. Uh, we spend most of our times, uh, most of our times addressing emergencies. So 31% people think that is what they are doing. Uh, we focus on regulatory compliance rather than security best practices, 27%. So you can go down the list, right? Uh, and for your company, mostly for this, if you're in a managerial position, uh, this is going to be some good uh, insights for you when you are making decisions, right? So, uh, but that is just, I think when you go down in the report, you are going to get uh, more insights into how they came about with those numbers. Now, how SOX work, they also have it listed on here. Okay, so let's go through, they have resiliency in the main metrics, uh, incident alerts and threats vectors, Existential impact, uh, lack of resiliency, vector by vector. Okay. So, goals and strategies. Oh, from zero trust, from nest to zero to uh, resilience hero. Recommendations. Okay. So, recommendations, best practices, what you can do to help improve your uh, organization's security posture overall. Right, so uh, not that of it's only thirty eight pages, so a pretty uh, simple report that you can easily go through. Right, so that is from Splunk. Now let's move into Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report. Uh, they started two hundred eight, okay, two hundred eight to twenty twenty two. So this is the twenty twenty two report. Uh, I assume. Okay, so for them. Uh, we will jump straight into this quick overview of what they also have going on here. Real finance. Okay, so there are four key paths leading to your estate uh, credentials, phishing, uh, exploiting vulnerabilities, and bad nets. Okay, so for data breaches, I think like what they found to be the uh, the lead corporates when it comes to uh, attackers being able to breach your uh, network credentials, phishing, uh, exploiting vulnerabilities and bad nets, right? Ransom and then also ransomware, uh, which big corporates. Uh, ransomware, this is like the ransomware curve that they have. It keeps increasing 2020. So look at the jump from 2019 to 2021. And it's only going to go up, right? I'm not sure ransomware is going to come down this way. It is only going to go up. But this will give you some insights into uh, ransomware attacks as well. Now, misconfiguration also from 2019. So uh, how attackers are able to use misconfiguration to breach uh, networks uh, is also increasing, right? And kind of came down a little bit here. I don't know what made it come, like what made it, you know, come down uh, at this point. But uh, if you read more into it, uh, you have to know. So results and analysis of your yeah, findings, uh, friend in low places. All right, and mostly, frankly, uh, I love the reports that have kind of more of, you know, a statistical appeal, right? So they have like the charts and stuff that make it, you know, easy to di digest, right? So uh, I don't know what the, the actions shown tell a story of how security incidents or breaches play out, right? It's a bit like a Hollywood action movie, only the modest budget and there are no exploitations or car chases. Okay, so I mean, this is whoever wrote this trying to be a big 
uh, fancy, right? So hacking malware errors. Okay, so for breaches, I think by order of percentages on how uh, how well attackers were able to use that, or you know how common that was, uh, one of the ways, or how common attackers were able to use that is what how they have it like listed here. So web application uh, hacking uh, DDoS. Uh, so with DDoS attackers, they don't really get onto your network, but they just, uh, they attack availability. So your systems are going to be offline. Uh, backdoor, okay, so the whole list goes on. Now, uh, everybody should also take a look at this uh, OA throwback. So at least you know how this looks like. Uh, we are going to move on to another report, right? So really good insights, uh, a lot to be learned there. Let's go to Cisco. So Cisco has, it's only 23 pages, which is good. So uh, privacy growing impacts and uh, importance and impacts. Also follow the same format content, uh, go all the way down to, I don't think for Cisco's, uh, I didn't really see anything that really stands out that I really want to point out, but uh, just wanted to go through it. So also for appearance, you know, this is what I mostly like because it kind of a visual person. It makes it makes it make more sense, right? And if you are, you know, like you don't have the time to go through the whole entire write up, you can just pick up some uh, key uh, insights from this one. So top job responsibilities among security professionals. Okay. Uh, this is also pretty cool. So compliance. So depending on where you are, depends on what your responsibilities are. So risk assessment and management folks, they are way up there, right? Uh, CISOs and leadership, not bad over there. Okay. Number of privacy metrics. All right. So yes, we've seen this one also. Uh, you also get some insight from this. So now let's move on to another report. This report, I think, did well. Yeah, we just looked at the yes, we just looked at this. This is from NIST. Uh, so we saw NIST already. ISACAS, we didn't look at ISACAS. So this is ISACA State of Cybersecurity 2020 uh, Global Updates on Workforce. Okay, I think. For the workforce thing that I was talking about, uh, for how long it takes to fill cybersecurity positions and stuff, it was from ISACA, not the not the uh, ISC Square one that I saw. Uh, it was from ISACA, I think. So ISACA is also forty one pages. Uh, most of these reports, I think, on average, they are not that much too. They are not too lengthy for you to be able to digest. And ISACA also, they do really much of a good job with these, you know, diagrams and stuff to make it easy and appealing to everybody. So uh, respondents, you know, for their research. Industries represented for this research, uh, just like the one that we saw, uh, but that was at the bottom of the page of the whole entire uh, write-up. Web, okay, this was what I was looking for. So workforce by age, right? Uh, 18 to 24, 1%, uh, 25 to 35, 11, 11%. So this is uh, workforce by age in the cyber security or information security, right? Now 35 to 44 and 45 to 54 uh, are the highest in terms of age working within the security space. 55 to, 65, to 64, 16, 65 and up, and uh, prefer not to answer the question is 5%, right? So uh, some of these people, we can still distribute over these ages, right? So there is really no age limit. So if you call me and I tell you there is no age limit, it's not just me saying it, right? Uh, you didn't see 65 and above, you didn't see zero. You saw 2%. So if you are uh, 85 and you want to work in security, yes, you can still work in security, right? if you want to. So uh, there is really no age limit. I don't think anybody is going to tell you no if they you prove to them that you can do the job. Right now, uh, cybersecurity staffing. 
So how would you describe the current staffing uh, of your organization? So significantly understaffed is 15%, somewhat understaffed 47% appropriately, uh, staffed 34%, somewhat overstaffed 2%. So, I mean, obviously uh, security is never overstaffed, maybe probably for, I don't even think for any company, you can have enough security professionals, right? Retention difficulties. So it's kind of uh, difficult to retain cybersecurity professionals. Uh, I think over the years, it was, it, it keeps dropping now. Uh, it's now at 60 again, uh, going up. So it's a bit difficult. Maybe they find a better gig somewhere with high paying money, so they will leave and go. Right? Uh, on field positions, uh, so does your organization have on field positions from cybersecurity professionals or people within the organization that they ask? Yes, 63% said yes. Uh, 29% said no. I don't know, it was 8%. Vacancies within the cyber. Okay, so this was what I was talking about. Now, time to fill cybersecurity positions within organizations. So, statistically speaking, it takes, I think, 25, 23% more time to fill cybersecurity positions than to fill any IT, any other IT position. Right. Uh, if you didn't get that. So, if it's going to take maybe, let's say, this uh, is just you know, for an example. Right. It is going to take three days to fill any IT position. It's going to take five days or maybe six days to fill a cybersecurity position. Right. That is why you go through like five or like three plus interviews, mostly three. Right. Uh, sometimes four. Uh, but sometimes, like most of the times, most of the, uh, you know, meet and greets with your uh, hiring manager or whoever the recruiter is, we don't really count that as an interview. Right. So how long does it take? Uh, overall, how long does it take your organization? Now, if you look at some 23% uh, long uh, more or like more time to fill cybersecurity positions than uh, other IT positions. And percentage of unfilled cybersecurity positions at given organizational levels. So for different levels within the organization, you know, we have managerial positions, senior managerial, uh, you have technical, non-technical, uh, consulting roles. So all those uh, statistics of unfilled positions in those areas are here, right? So for uh, anybody who's looking to, okay, I want a security manager or a managerial position, uh, what am I looking at? And these colors are by, by uh, so yes. So these colors were almost, so by uh, like whatever they had on there for answers for that question is what, uh, they have like these colors for it. And let's move on. So on field positions reporting uh, from 2018 to 2022, you have it right there, right? So for the blue is 2018. Uh, and then so coming down all the way to 2022, so executive level, uh, obviously, executive level, we don't feel is you don't have as much people there as you know, uh, all the way down here to the individual contributor or the technical cybersecurity people, right? So the base is always bigger than the top in any uh, institution or in any in, uh, industry that you go to, right? So this is also some good insights for you. Uh, future hiring demands. For okay, in the next year, do you see? So these were some of the uh, survey questions or interview questions they asked people within the industry. Uh, in the next year, do you see the demand for the following cybersecurity positions uh, or the following cybersecurity position levels increasing or decreasing uh, or remaining the same? So individual contributors or technical cybersecurity folks or people are called uh, implementers. Uh, the people are actually doing the legwork, uh, some people said 82. So 82 is increase, increase, no increase, decrease. So everybody think it's going to increase. Now, if you look at, I think it's only okay, it's for senior managers and directors, uh, they think it's not going to really increase that much. Uh, for executive C-suite, 
uh, not going to increase that much or oh, no change. Okay, so no change was really big in the top uh, executive level. RN demands, okay, for years. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, okay. Pipeline changes, I don't know what that is, but percentage of cybersecurity applica applicants who are well qualified. Uh, they have the list also on here by, um, okay, so on average, how many cybersecurity applicants are well qualified for the positions for which they are applying uh, to? So one to 25%, uh, 50 to 75%, 100 to, okay, not applicable. And candidates qualification. So uh, how important are each of the following factors in determining, in determining if a cybersecurity candidate is qualified? So prior hands-on cybersecurity experience, credentials, hands-on experience, employer recommendation, university degrees, uh, association membership. So as association membership. Uh, so if you are kind of a member of ISACA or uh, IAC Square or any of these uh, other bodies, right? So, and the answers were what? Very important, somewhat important, not important, right? Okay, all the way to I don't know. So, hands-on experience, obviously very important. Credentials, uh, uh, very important, somewhat important. Uh, Hands-on, okay, uh, somewhat important, important. Yep, so, I mean, you can go through and look at that. Uh, quantified skills gap, all right. So this is also one place that you're gonna get a lot of good insights, right? So what are the biggest skills gap, uh, skill gaps you see in today's cybersecurity professionals? Now, uh, don't say I didn't tell you. Look all the way here. What is this right here? Soft skills. I mean, and the, like I've not seen these statistics uh, from ISACA prior to this, right? But I can tell you on authority, this is agreed. Soft skills is what is mostly going to make you or make you during interviews. It's not your technical skills. So I keep stressing on soft skills in cybersecurity. And some people think, oh, yeah, 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 you know, I'm just going to chase technical skills and totally ignore soft skills or try to groom myself on that side when it comes to interviews or even on the job, right? Uh, if you don't know how to really manipulate within the soft skills area, uh, you are going to be eating for dinner, right? So uh, soft skills, they play a critical role in cybersecurity, not just in cybersecurity, in all other, uh, in all other industries as well, but in IT, or in cybersecurity specifically, it, like it plays a very uh, critical role. So if you have good soft skills, you are in a better position. That is why I tell everybody, uh, you know, uh, people come in and they are like, okay, I don't have any uh, experience going into the job. If I'm done with maybe some cybersecurity training elsewhere, and I want to apply for a job, I don't have an experience. I don't have any experience. You are wrong because you don't know what you don't know. Now, what we are looking for in terms of experience in cybersecurity is not just technical experience. Soft skills experience also counts, right? So if you're in a managerial position for the past 10 years and you are switching into cybersecurity, uh, you can leverage yourself more if you, you, after gaining some technical skills, leverage yourself into a managerial role, cyber managerial role, where you are not necessarily going to be on daily basis applying your technical knowledge, but you'll be applying your soft skills that you've acquired over years, right? And if your soft skills are heavy, applying for a managerial role or a, a role that requires more soft skills, you look like a rock star, right? As opposed to you have a lot of soft skills, you know, uh, coming in and your if your technical skills are kind of, uh, you know, kind of not really up to speed and you are going to apply for a purely technical, uh, like, uh, like a purely technical role, you are going to run into uh, a lot of frustrations, right? So that is why, oh yeah, they are not giving me the role because I don't have experience. They are not giving, no, you have to know what to apply for and what not to apply for, right? It's not because you have, you've done some cybersecurity training now, all cybersecurity jobs you are qualified for. You might, but which ones 
are you really going to you know uh, do well in right so all that you can pick inside from uh reports like this right so uh for areas so for skills uh computing cloud computing skills uh 52 percent right so cloud is you know something that everybody should also be eyeing coding skills uh is 33 percent now software development so the list goes on uh system hardening blah 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 all that okay so well some good insights right there uh, cyber security degree confidence strongly agree strongly disagree neither agree nor disagree okay so they didn't really read the entirely like the entirety of this i think this has to do with uh university insights into i think maybe degrees as it, as it pertains to cyber security so you can you know if you go through this you get some good insights on there as well right now skills gap among recent graduates uh they're still going down the list so you can also gain a lot of insights on that as well retention that is more of for hr and top management so employee benefit like employer uh benefits so pay uh employees certification fees okay so uh some of the benefits that you're going to get for working within the industry qualifying workforce issues now we're spending a little bit more time on this than the others because i think this is more interesting than the previous one the other workforce that we looked at, right? The other ones were not workforce related. Now, top five soft skills that you need in cybersecurity. So please choose top five uh, most important soft skills needed by cybersecurity professionals in your organization today. So one, communication, writing, uh, and speaking, critical thinking, problem solving, uh, teamwork. So I think, frankly, I think teamwork should be up here. You know, maybe probably replace critical thinking or teamwork should be shoulder uh, hand in hand with uh, communication, right? Uh, attention to detail. Attention to detail should also be moved up to above critical thinking, right? Uh, you can think, you can have really good critical thinking skills. If you don't pay attention to detail, all that is going to go to waste, right? Uh, adopt to changes, decision making, leadership skills. Okay, yeah. Uh, writing, conflict resolution. This should also go a little bit up. I think in terms of percentage, honesty, yes, empathy. Okay, so some good insights, right? And mostly, I uh, just want to go back a little bit to give some free advice on this. So mostly for soft skills, uh, during interviews, they are not going to ask you, hey, uh, are you a good problem solver? <laughs> Nobody's going to ask you that. Uh, do you pay attention to detail? Nobody's going to ask you that. But how do they get answers or how do they, how are they going to know that you're a critical thinker or how are they going to know that you are a good problem solver, right? They are going to infer all these answers from questions that they ask you that you, we are not really going to think much about, right? Sometimes it's even in the initial meet and greet conversation. Hey, so, you know, how are you doing? What do you do? What are your hobbies? You know, so why did you go to this school and not that school? You think all those are just, uh getting to know each other they are not they are part of the interview right so don't be too relaxed and just be talking for talking sake uh because if i ask you why did you choose school a right instead of school b and you just say yeah because my best friend went there so i chose it now that wasn't really uh, you, have, you didn't really demonstrate uh, any form of critical thinking there right you just follow your friend right uh if uh like they ask you about something else so how well do you work with people or you know are you a team player or you you like you love to work independently and if you are like oh yeah i just i just love to i don't like dealing with people i just shut your foot like you just shut yourself in the foot right here teamwork <laughs> right so uh mostly i think in one of our cyber chats we had one student who went for an interview and he was so frustrated because the lady was just they were just it was a normal conversation right uh, they were talking about they didn't ask him anything about cyber security or even the job description or anything just picking his brain on why he moved from texas to new york or why he just talking about normal stuff why why would you do this instead of this and you know just picking like uh, picking up some like it's like you're talking to like some stranger you met at the uh, like at the bar stop right so you are just picking on some conversation that 
doesn't really bother on anything. Now, just after that very light conversation, uh, they sent him an email that they are moving on with somebody else. And he couldn't, you know, phantom why they didn't interview him, but they are moving on with somebody else. But he forgot that that whole interview, they were, you know, uh, they were trying to gauge his critical thinking, his problem solving, like everything in terms of soft skills, right? I think that job was more heavy on soft skills. So just picking up, you know, like talking to you and you think is this conversation is just a casual conversation. Please, in interviews, there is nothing like casual conversation. So even if they're asking you about sports and, hey, did you watch that, you know, match? It was really nice, that baseball game. Still, you know, don't lose your guard. That is all that I'm trying to say. Right? Don't lose your guard and just go off and just be talking nonsense. Because if you do, that is going to go against you. Now you don't understand why you answered all your technical questions right. And, you know, I think you think you did so well, but they didn't pick you. You might have said something that triggered. They are like, mm, okay, so maybe probably we're not going with this person or, you know, uh, we might move on with somebody else. So uh, getting back on course, uh, means of mitigating technical skills gap. Okay, so they have all that here as well. So good insights from uh, Isaac's report. Yes, I think this is Isaac's report that we are still looking at. Uh, Okay, I think let's look at this real. Okay, enterprise security budget outlook. Okay. I thought it was going to focus on uh, threat landscape. So threat landscape. Uh, let's see what they got for trend threat landscape. Okay. So threat actors, common threat actors that. You know, people think they've encountered on the job is what they've listed on here. Uh, attack types also on here. All right. So obviously, uh, there's more interesting stuff in this report. So I'm going to move on to another report, right? That way we can wrap it up for tonight. Uh, I think the last one that we'll look at or what we've not looked at is the incident response. So we looked at Splunk. We looked at uh, NIST. No, no, this is not this. This is Verizon. Uh, we've looked at Verizon data breach. We've looked at Cisco. Uh, let me move this out of the way. We've looked at NIST. We've looked at, uh, this is what we are looking at, uh, ISACA. And in, okay, we looked at uh, ISC squared already. So the last one left that we're going to look at is the incident response, right? And for most organizations, this is what is going to help you uh, really bounce back when you run into an incident or when there's a data breach or anything of that sort. Now, everybody, if you're a security professional on here, uh, if you don't want to look at any of the reports that we looked at, please do look at the incident response because it is going to help you and your organization. And then also, uh, in terms of planning, uh, this is going to be your go-to, right? There are other good incident response, uh, like incident re reports out there. Uh, can't remember, maybe most of them off head, but uh, you can Google them and you find most of them uh, on there. So just from the little summary that they have on the executive summary, uh, so 70% of incident uh, response cases over the past 12 months were ransomware and business email compromise. Right now, you just have some really big insights just by looking at just this first page. Right, so within your company, you know that you have to be putting in place uh, controls to prevent business email compromise and then also to prevent ransomware. So seventy percent were ransomware business, and seventy-seven percent were uh, of intrusions are suspected to be caused by initial access vectors. Uh, example: phishing exploitation of known software vulnerabilities, brute force attacks, uh, primarily that focus primarily on remote desktop uh, protocols. And then also more than 87% of positive uh, identified vulnerabilities fell into one of six main categories. So proxy shell, logic 4J, uh, sonic wall, proxy logon, uh, Zohu, uh, Okay, so Zohu's uh, Managed Engine and Art Self Plus and Fortnite. 
So vulnerabilities, they, like vulnerabilities that were found, they were uh, six. They were categorized into six main uh, categories, right? Or grouped into six main categories, and these are here. Uh, now, seven percent, uh, seven most targeted industries were. See, so uh, I think. Now maybe most everybody on here is really getting the like that like the twist on or getting the idea behind why you have to go through such reports because it just will equip you with a lot of knowledge and skill, right? So if you are sitting in a meeting and they are asking about or like debating uh, maybe how much they have to you know put up in terms of uh, resources to prevent ransomware or to prevent uh, any of. Uh, like anything else, let's say maybe probably uh, like Logic 4 or like Sonic Wolf, yeah, debating about it now is easy. Then like the numbers are obvious, right? Which one are you going to put more money to and which one? And also for presentations and everything else that you want to do and research, uh, this is really going to help you and your organization out. And for you, it's going to make you look like a rock star, right? Uh, knowing these numbers is not how many years you've worked in the industry is how much you want to research into what is going on into the industry, right? You can be working in the industry for 300 years and still not know any of these. You might think that ransomware is very, you know, uh, prevalent now, but you don't know at what percentage, right? Maybe you've, maybe email, uh, business email compromise not even uh, on your radar, right? You don't even know what is going on on that side. But now guess what? 70% of all incidents, you know, were attributed to business email compromise, right? So it's not how long you've worked in the industry, it's how much you want to research and how much you want to learn, right? Now, I think for, and for industries, which industries suffered the most breaches? Uh, seven major industries, so financial uh, or finance, uh, professional and legal services, manufacturing, healthcare, high tech, uh, wholesale and retail. Right. So if you work in any of these industries, then you know that you have to, you know, uh, you have to your your cybersecurity game has to be on on point, right? And fifty percent, okay. So fifty percent of targeted organizations lack, okay, multi-factor authentication uh, on key internet-facing systems such as a corporate uh, web web mail or virtual uh, private network solutions and other remote access solutions, right? So this is just by looking at this page gives you a lot of really good info to help your organization, right? I think everybody should, at least if you are not going to download any of these, download this one from Palo Alto. Uh, if you Google incident response, uh, incident response report 2022 from Palo Alto, and I think they call it unit, unit 24, uh, so you are going to get this. And now everything that we looked at was executive summary. When we go deep into the report, it breaks it down, right? How incident response data can help prevent bad days. Uh, it breaks it down. It even shows you what you can do with this, right? Uh, how to use this report. And it goes on and on. I think for our internship, this was posted for, for the internship that is about to wrap up. Uh, they will be graduating here, I think, in the next two weeks. Uh, they had this. Uh, they, like this was posted when they were doing their incident uh, response week or weeks. I think we took two weeks to do it. Uh, so please do go ahead and uh, at least download this one. If not for any of them, just this one will give you some really good insight because just the executive summary uh, gives you a lot of a lot of really good insight. And they also have uh, what I like: the statistical appeal and all those diagrams and uh, charts for you to really make sense of everything that is going on so the list that they they made for uh, industries that were that like industries that were most affected they even have it by the type of attack right so i think like this uh, is very insightful so this is why you know if you want to get ahead of the game in the security space is not how many years you've worked is going to give you uh, experience but when it comes to facts how many how many years you've worked uh, is not really going to cut it. You have to research and dig deep into reports and you know other publications within the industry. Okay. So I think with that we are going to wrap it up here and uh, pause for questions and then we will wrap it up.
and close for tonight. Uh, Alexander, you have a question or that was from previously? Uh, I think Alexander probably was from previously. Right. Uh, uh, question. Go ahead. I know I spoke with you this afternoon and I'm here in late. My question is, I saw you spoke a lot of things just in the next five minutes I got in. Is it possible I can get a audio of what you thought today to an email so I can review what you said already? And then second is um, the registration we talked about ISA this afternoon from Georgia, John. Okay. Okay, so uh, recording of this will be posted. Uh, we are streaming live on YouTube, so the live uh, version will be on there already. And the recording will be uh, also posted maybe probably tomorrow morning, right? So, but, and for uh, the income sharing agreement, then we will send you the link uh, on the backend. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, go ahead and then Eric will follow. Um, so hi, I do, um, Emmanuel, I do. Um, my name is Daniel, this is my first time here. Um, someone um, sent me the link and I joined. Um, actually, what you're teaching were really insightful. I'm actually into PCI. Um, I'm also doing PCI DSS with a uh, different uh, school as well. Um, but I, I was kind of interested in the vulnerability management tools um, because that's probably I have to, I'm taking, trying to take the certifications with the uh, companies themselves like Splunk, uh, Nurses, and, um, and there's also one that I think that I really wanted to do, which is Qualys. Uh, BDMA. Oh. So I, that's probably what I was going through your programs. I wanted to be sure if um, with the uh, hands-on um, security, uh, I saw some hands-on course like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, where you have all those tools that you have. So I just wanted to find out uh, if it's self-paced, something you can do within some few time because Actually, I'm done with my PCI DSS training though, but the tools is where I have that issues because they just ask you to go and learn the tools from, get the certifications from other, um, uh, from the um, websites. They have free uh, um, training and all that, yes. right? Yes, yeah. So that's probably what I was looking at. Uh, I don't know if it works that way. Okay, so uh, maybe just we'll talk a little bit and. Uh, we can talk mm -hmm. offline. So you are done with your PCI DSS training uh, and you are waiting to get to know how to use some of the vulnerability scanning tools? Yes, the vulnerability scanning tools. I mean, I, because most of the jobs you see that come out, they they much about vulnerability scanning, risk management and all that. So if you don't know how to are use those, some of those things. No, are the two, like are the job descriptions you're talking about, are, are those purely PCI jobs or they are just general cybersecurity jobs? So the are general cybersecurity, PCI jobs. I mean, it, it, uh, we are trained to be like ISAs, right? Not uh, QSAs because they want us to be ISAs before we can work with a QSA company to become QSAs. So, so um, PCI jobs, I'm applying, but I feel that I still need some of this uh, to learn these tools so that that could also help me expand my tentacles, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, great. So for our cybersecurity entry, uh, our cybersecurity hands-on training, uh, we take you through a variety of tools, right? Give you exposure to uh, most of the tools. So Nexus, Splunk, Qualys, uh, and then uh, virtualization itself. So help you set up your own cybersecurity lab, right? Uh, download some vulnerable machines like Metasploitable and the rest. Uh, show you how to use, do like uh, port scans and stuff like that, how to analyze uh, reports and stuff like that. So if that is what you're looking for, yes, then uh, that course will help you uh, to yeah. do as a leader. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's where I have a, for, a short form. And um, everything we're talking about, I've also been watching on YouTube a lot and everything makes a lot of sense. And what, that is where I have a lot of short form. I mean, using the tools because I've never used them before. It's my first okay. time. Okay. Okay. Very well. Uh, thank you. Eric. Hello, Doc. Um, 
my question is uh, after the completion of this uh, a workshop internship uh, program. Are we going to be awarded a certificate? And uh, the second one is, uh, would this certificate be uh, recognized by the various IT bodies out there, either nationally or worldwide? Thank you. Uh, yes and yes. So short uh, answer to your questions. Uh, two questions is yes and yes. So you're gonna get two certificates uh, from a uh, two in one, but one in, uh, there's nothing like one in two, but two in one, right? Okay, so uh, okay. it's gonna be one from, from us and then also for the company that you work for, right? Uh, so one from Arrhythmus Academy and then one for from the company that you, you work for and you can use it anywhere. Uh, yes, you did work for those companies and those companies, you can also cite them on your resume uh, as part of, so if like on your resume, you did work for, uh, either that's right here or ADDI uh, if you're working for any of those uh, companies. So, yes. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And now I'm going to go through the the chat in here real quick. Uh, I think, like, uh, Michael, was anything uh, outstanding in the chat? Um, okay, no, I'm going here. No. Go ahead. Okay, I'll wait. Daniel, no, no, I don't see anything. Yeah, you can go ahead, Daniel. Oh no, I, I actually I asked my question already, so I just wanted clarity on. Um, so I actually want to do the hands-on, right, and just to get to use you know know how to use the tools, and that's actually where my concern. Is. So uh, that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, so I just wanted guidance on what to do. I see that you have a promo that uh, is ending tomorrow. And yes. uh, and this this is actually so saddening for me. So I'm just looking at it. Okay, okay, Mike, uh, Daniel, uh, Eric. I think Eric just asked this question, so I'm going to lower Eric Eric's hand. So for the late Jason, go ahead. Uh, greetings, Doctor. Um, going back to the situation at the beginning. So I asked the question in the chat, but I thought I think it's lost now. So based on the situation, as I said before, it was posted on Discord for a couple of days before and other social media sites before it caught traction and got on the news. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in terms of data loss prevention that, or any other system that are in place that could track the movement of the data once it leaves the site and also do anything else, modify, delete, is there anything in our arsenal for things like those? Uh, so you are referring to the Air Force incident, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, you might think within the Air Force or within like the military certain, uh, like security is really uh, high notch, but unfortunately it is not so, right? They, they try to, you know, as much as they can, but in practice, uh, it is normal people like, you know, uh, everybody, anybody else working elsewhere that is uh, handling this form of data. So uh, when it comes to maybe putting in place stringent data loss prevention uh, systems in place, maybe they might have some of it. Uh, I know within like the unit, the last unit that I used to work for uh, in a day, it will surprise you how many uh, phishing uh, at, uh, emails that we were getting and we were blocking. Uh, in a day, it was more than like maybe 50,000 plus. Wow. Right? So, yeah, systems do work. Uh, but when it comes to internal uh, threats, it's a bit dicey, right? Uh, it's really a bit dicey. Like, how would you know the pilots that you're flying, the plane with, you guys have flew for uh, years, you know, will uh, probably had a bomb on him on this last flight. <laughs> <laughs> How would you know, right? I mean, you like those ones you can really you can really not anticipate. So uh, insider threats, you can do everything because everything that we do and plan is mainly for outside. If somebody is in the inside already, they've you know kind of uh, crossed a lot of the security already, right? Like they are inside, so most of the security stuff that we're pushing out there is not going to apply to them. So even with data loss prevention, yes, of course. Uh, if I try to 
uh, send something, you know, that I'm not supposed to, the data loss prevention system is going to catch it. But what if, uh, like, I think Eliku was the one who said it, uh, he printed it, right? And probably he printed it at work, right? So yes. who is going to search him? <laughs> who is going to search him and see that he's not carrying uh, classified documents in his pocket, right? Taking it home or in his bag. Right? So those ones, it becomes a bit, uh, you just have to trust the integrity of the person. But I mean, at least there has to be some level of trust for, you know, everywhere, like for people that we are working with. It, because trust, you know, although it's not a good security strategy, <laughs> but it's part of security strategy, unfortunately, like unfortunately, right? Because like I'm saying, how would you know they are just going to grab it and take it away? So I think like when uh, in the army back when I was stationed in uh, South Korea, uh, one day I uh, we were in the office and there was some like a bunch, like a pile of papers on the floor somewhere. And I'm like, uh, like why do they have this here? You know, uh, pick a couple of it up and guess what was on there? A list of people's names and social securities and dates of death, just hanging out <laughs> <laughs> on the floor, and people are stepping on it, going back and forth, mining them. Like what? Right. So if uh, I picked it and I had no integrity. Uh, I can probably put all of it and pretend I'm going to put it in the trash and take it home. I uh, yeah, that, and nobody is going to ask me anything. So uh, all those lapses are there. I mean, it's still a human inst uh, institution. So uh, you know, sometimes we just have to trust on the training and uh, integrity we try and do, instill, especially in the like in the military setting. Integrity we are instilling in, in people, uh, trust it is going to work. So that is my Thank little you, take. Doctor. On that one. You've yes. been teaching me a lot, but you're also destroying my dream of doing the things just like in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. So without any questions, uh, I think in the chat, uh, anything else in the chat that we didn't address? If you had a question in the chat and we didn't address, you can please unmute yourself and ask. So, oh, I, think, so I don't know if you're here. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I don't know if you already addressed it, but someone was asking uh, what is the best way to uh, prevent ransomware? Someone's asking the uh, best way to prevent a ransomware. Is it, um, and the person was asking, does it depend on the type of network or the threat landscape or um, what, what's the best way? Okay, so uh, I also counter that with a question, right? Uh, so, you know, I keep stressing on security. When we, we talk about security, we have to address security. Uh, through uh, three main lenses, right? Uh, people, processes, and uh, uh, like, what is the last one? People, processes, and technology, right? So when it comes to ransomware, which of these three do you think is uh, the route that attackers are easily able to use to get onto our networks to perpetuate ransomware? Anybody want to give it a shot? If we know the answer to that, then we will know what is going to be the best way to prevent ransomware. Okay, uh, go ahead, Rodriguez. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Du. Um, I can't wait for the class to start for the uh, PCI DSS. Um, during the class, uh, do you recommend any uh, re reinforcement? For example, um, you know, uh, Udemy or anything that comes to your mind that we can uh, process while the class is, uh, you know, while, while we take in the class. Any reinforcement? Okay, so, okay, with a PCI uh, for maybe I probably leave it for people in the PCI class to uh, speak to that, but there is a lot of material to be covered. So I don't uh, really think you have that luxury of looking elsewhere. Master what we give you, and then if you want anything else. Uh, I think like everything that we're giving you is almost everything that you need, right? Even more. Uh, anything else that you need outside of that will be uh, maybe probably getting an updated like documents from PCI in terms of maybe uh, like a new update to like one of their frameworks or something, right? But aside that, uh, anywhere else that you want to learn PCI, most of it will be kind of introductory stuff, uh, especially like with Udemy. People on there are just not saying people are not also trying, but uh, some of the courses that I've seen there is just uh, even our PCI for beginners has more stuff in there than most of the paid courses elsewhere. So uh, you are going to be bombarded with a lot of material, a lot. So just fasten your seatbelt and be ready 
there's going to be too much for you to do uh, in that aspect. But I think to the question, uh, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, to the question that I was asking, uh, how is, through which route is ransomware able to get onto our networks? Uh, when we look at it from the PayPal processes and technology uh, standpoint, somebody just posted in the PayPal, right? Because now uh, I will say, not based on any research that I've done, but just on my own experience and industry knowledge, uh, probably maybe 80 to 90% of all ransomware attacks, they are executed through phishing attacks, right? So phishing, people, fall, people easily fall you know, a victim to phishing emails. And through that, attackers are able to get onto their network and then encrypt everything and uh, you know, ask for a ransom. So if we want to tackle ransomware and try to prevent ransomware attack, we have to tackle the PayPal aspect of security. So awareness, security awareness training and just security education uh, is, you know, uh, I would say on top of my list when it comes to trying to prevent ransomware attack. Because you can put in place all the technological uh, solutions that you want, but if killer just decides to click on any email that comes away, right? Your uh, data loss prevention systems and your uh, saw tools and your uh, SOC tools and your none of that is going to help, right? Uh, so we have to tackle the people aspect. And the people are the most vulnerable when it comes to any security setting, right? They are the ones who are curious. They are the ones who are going to uh, open emails and do all sort of stuff. So uh, we have to tackle the people aspect. So simple answer, if you want to address ransomware within any company, you have to really uh, focus really much and take your security awareness training very seriously, right? It doesn't have to be once a, like, uh, once a year, right? So it has to be in your face the whole time. Every month, every month, you have to be doing it. And also expose them to a lot of case studies when it comes to ransomware. Uh, that way they are more cautious, right? Uh, so that is my uh, long answer to that short question. All right, so uh, we are wrapping it up here. I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, thank you very much. Fridays, you could have been anywhere, uh, but you chose to be here to share knowledge. Uh, Kwabina, uh, I'll, okay, I'll give Kwabina the floor and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, go ahead, Kwabina. Yes, uh, real quick, Dr. Edu. Uh, so you mentioned AI, artificial intelligence. You mentioned that a bit. Where do you think that fits into the, to the mix in terms of what you just spoke of, in terms of preventing things like uh, this type of uh, activity that you just mentioned? Are oh, you talking about pre uh, preventing uh, ransomware? Yes. Uh, so uh, AI is a bit broad, right? It depends on uh, what tool we are looking at and what AI, uh, like the role AI is playing in that tool. Right, uh, but AI, so how AI is able to help uh, in how we have it set up. So if maybe probably is we have set it up where uh, uh, like, your, like your firewall has some artificial uh, intelligence or any solution you are using has artificial intelligence, uh, how it can help is uh, it's able to kind of detect uh, things that we will ordinarily not be able to detect, right? It's able to, Look at patterns and use that to make uh, like yes. decisions and 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 block traffic, right? So uh, unlike back in the day where we are just using access control for our firewalls and routers, uh, those we were just going to allow or deny. But uh, if an attacker is able to probably encrypt a malware, it's going to pass through, right? Because firewalls were not able to decrypt the traffic and to you know actually look at what is being transmitted. But now with AI, uh, some firewalls, you know, the new generation firewalls, they are able to really analyze uh, most of these and kind of get ahead of the attackers with some of the tricks that they use to bypass some of the solutions that we have. So yeah, AI plays a, a really key role, but then we come all the way back, circle back to us, people, yeah. right? <laughs> Most problematic uh, in any security setting. So uh, we shouldn't forget that as security professionals, uh, people are the ones who are going to configure systems. People are the ones who are going to click on emails. People are the ones who are doing everything. So uh, even with the security solutions that we put in place, 
if the people who are configuring it, if they don't know what they are doing, uh, our security solution that cost us thousands of dollars will, will look as if we didn't have it because it is not configured right. So uh, if we have the most expensive, maybe uh, like firewall system that we've set up and we have, uh, we are using default username and password on it. I mean, come on. <laughs> Uh, attackers can easily just, you know, uh, log in from anywhere and, you know, have their day. So uh, the people aspect, uh, always very critical, always very critical. That is why there's always room for uh, uh, improvement in security. So there is nothing like 100%, you know, uh, security. And because there's also nothing like zero risks. So the people aspect, I mean, we cannot stress on that enough, right? All right, everyone. Uh, so... Without any more question, I think there was a question in here again. Uh, when will the thirty yes. percent discount yes. expire? So thirty percent discount expires tomorrow night. Uh, and for PCI DSS class, we are starting on Tuesday. And okay, so the link and everything will be sent out for all students in the PCI DSS, right? For you to join on Tuesday. So uh, we are wrapping it up. I appreciate everybody's time. I'll see everybody next week, God willing, for all students in different classes. We will meet during the week. If this is your first time, uh, please go to our website, take our free courses. And also on our YouTube, check out our YouTube channel. We have a lot of good info like what we talked about today. Uh, good topics on there that you can learn from. And uh, stay safe. And we'll meet again next week, God willing. Have a blessed weekend. Thank you.